It's not a reptile, but it's maybe one of the most underappreciated cold-blooded pets. We're talking about poison dart frogs. They're amazing, the enclosures are beautiful, and today I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know to take care of poison dart frogs. My name's Adam, this is Diamond. You're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles. Stick around. Now normally when I do a care guide, I'll have the animal and be able to hold it, but it turns out that holding poison dart frogs isn't a great idea. Not because they're poisonous, because they're not. They actually get their poison from the things that they eat in the wild. They'll eat things like ants and other types of invertebrates, and those things can be metabolized by the body of the frog and become poison that secretes through its skin. Neither here nor there. You're not supposed to hold them because they can take in toxins through their skin, so don't hold your poison dart frog. With that, let's just get into it. And a disclaimer here, um, some poison dart frogs are gonna be different than others, so do your research on the specific species that you keep. This is kind of a care guide for most species that I keep. They're all very similar. Let's just go ahead and get into it. The first thing you need to know is how big do these frogs get? Well, poison dart frogs are small. Now there's a bunch of different species. If you get, say, a uh, Renatomea, uh, like a thumbnail poison dart frog, or you get a uh, Mint Tribilis, which is a Philobates type species, they're gonna be very different. Some species are gonna be smaller than one inch. Some species will be almost two inches, like these Mint Terribilis here. These are my favorite species. I keep these guys upstairs in this beautiful enclosure. And the reason I do that is because they're very active and they're big and they're bold. So they're gonna be not hiding a lot of the time. Where my Leucamellas, they are going to be hiding quite a bit. I think that these are great display animals, but they're not going to be big. They're not gonna be impressive because of their size, they're gonna be impressive because of their color. Next, let's talk about enclosures because you can't just have a house poison dart frog. They're not gonna live in your house for a couple of reasons, but here's what I would recommend in terms of enclosure. If you're keeping small species in say one or two individually, or in a group of two or maybe even three, I would suggest something like an 18 by 18. You could get away with smaller species in something like a one by one by one. I personally don't like these because it just doesn't give you as the viewer too much to look at, but they're easy to keep track of the humidity and the temperature, and we're gonna talk about that next. But I would recommend if you're gonna keep something like uh, Terribilis or say Tinctorius species, right? These Tinctorius azurus, give about 10 gallons of space per dart frog, supposing that it's one and a half feet high. So for example, I keep uh, six of these Philobates terribilis, mint terribilis, inside of a 36 by 18 by 18. So technically it's only 50 gallons, but I think in terms of the space that it's given for these six frogs, I think it's perfect because they have lots of room to climb up and down and move all around. I just think that it's kind of a perfect space, but I wouldn't go more than six in this space. Now in their enclosure, I always recommend setting it up naturalistic. It's better for you to look at, it's more fun. Part of the fun of dart frogs, in my opinion, is the plants, the moss, the landscape, the hardscape, what it looks like on the inside. It's kind of like living art for your living room or wherever you're gonna put it. So I recommend doing a background. You can do this out of foam and then dry lock it. That's a great way to do it or uh, moss on the background like you see here in this enclosure. And then you can plant it. So you can plant it on the background. You can plant aeroids that way. You can plant inside of the soil. So the soil, the substrate that I use is an ABG mix. Uh, so I use things like a little bit of sand just to let it breathe, play sand of course course, organic. I use coconut core, I use sphagnum moss, and I mix it all together and that's going to keep it kind of fluffy and allow the roots of these plants to keep moving. And then in the background, I'll have little sections where I can put plants as well. And then I'll have things like margravia that'll actually climb on the background too. And then I have moss basically all over the place, branches jutting out, just kind of make it look like it's a forest. I've been in Central America where you find dart frogs and it looks exactly like this. I mean, the plants might be a little bit different, but this is kind of what you're looking at. Next, give them places to hide. So cork rounds is a great example or overturned coconut huts, basically half a coconut hollowed out with a little notch in it so they can get in there. That's what I like to do. And of course, give leaf litter as well. They'll hide underneath it and it gives them a place to get 
out of the wet because you're gonna have a misting system. I recommend it. Otherwise, you're gonna need to mist this thing all day and night. We're gonna get to humidity in a second. So I recommend a misting system. Mine goes off three times a day for eight seconds a piece and it just kind of gives a little bit of moisture inside the enclosure for the plants and to keep the humidity up. And I have a glass top on the enclosure to really help with that humidity but you can't have it perma-wet because some of these dart frog species will get foot rot and other diseases from being too wet. So give them places that are going to be dry that they can get out of a sopping spot and they can be on a dry type of place. They're gonna take moisture in through their skin. You don't need standing water, but you can always provide it if you want always use RO water, reverse osmosis. It's safe for these animals. Heat, humidity, and lighting. Now, heat, humidity, and lighting, this is pretty simple because dart frogs don't like warm type enclosures and they don't like it too cold either. They're pretty fragile to fluctuations. So what I recommend for most species, and again, every species is gonna be a little bit different, so do your research, but for most species, mid 70s, somewhere around 72 to 76 is what I recommend. So low to maybe mid, you can get away with getting up to 78, 79, but once you get up to plus 80 in a lot of spots, it's gonna be detrimental to the health of these animals. So don't go above 80. In my opinion, that's what I do. It doesn't work for me. And I keep many, many species of dart frogs. You don't need a hot spot, but I do recommend thermal regulation. So you have a spot where it's a little bit warmer and then you have spots where it's a little bit cooler. You can do that left to right, front to back, top to bottom. It doesn't really matter. Just give them different spaces where it's gonna be different temperatures so that they can choose because unlike humans, they can't decide, they can't, their bodies can't make temperature for them. They are gonna be the temperature of their surroundings. Now, humidity, this is gonna be dependent on the species as well. Now, for all the species that I keep, Minturibulus, Tinctorius, Leucamellas, uh, some Ufaga species as well, I always keep it right at around 80%. 70 to 90% or 70 to 100%, some people would say. And the reason is, they are very human loving species. You don't want them to get too dry. It'll dry out their skin, they will die. So you always give them options where in the leaf litter, it's gonna be a little bit more moist underneath. On top of the leaf litter, maybe not as moist, but you wanna give them options like inside of coconut huts, inside of cork rounds, where it's gonna be close to 100%, maybe put some sphagnum moss in there. And then if they go ahead and climb up a little bit higher, maybe it's only gonna be 70 or 80% humidity, but you wanna keep it pretty darn humid. And I always recommend having a little bit of screen top with the glass lid, so that you can keep the air moving, it doesn't get too stagnant because that can be not good for your plants or your animals. In terms of light, give them a day and night cycle, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, that works 14, 10, it's up to you. Just make sure they have a photo period and because you're likely gonna use natural plants, they're going to need some sort of grow light anyway, but don't worry about UVB. You can give them a shade dweller 2% UVB if you want. The problem is you're probably gonna be using a glass lid or I recommend it and UVB does not penetrate glass. So it's kind of for nothing. I mean, just give them something that's going to allow the plants to grow and let them know when it's daytime and then turn it off so they know that it's nighttime. They are a diurnal species. They're gonna be out during the day. That's why I love them. The next is diet. I love this because in captivity, they don't have any sort of toxin. You can handle them if you want. I don't recommend it. Don't do that. I'm just saying if you put one in your mouth or one of your orifices, again, don't put dart frogs in your orifices, but it wouldn't kill you because they're not toxic. And that's because they eat fruit flies for the most part. Now, certain species, say like the Santa Isabels that I do breed, when they're small, they are going to eat things like isopods, things like, like really tiny isopods. Springtails is actually a better option because they're so darn small. And there's two different types of, well, two common types of fruit flies. Hydei and Melangaster. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing those correctly. Melangasters are smaller. You're gonna feed these to smaller animals like smaller Ufaga species, uh, thumbnail dart frogs, Santa Isabel's, and then I feed Hydei to things like my Tinctorius, my Leucamellas, and also my Terribilis. But the Terribilis will actually eat small crickets. We're talking about eighth inch crickets once they become adult size. Now, of course, always feed the appropriately sized insect to your species. It's no different than a leopard gecko or a bearded dragon or anything else. The space between their eyes is how thick the feeder item should be. You can always be safe and just do fruit flies. Make sure you dust them with a calcium powder and a multivitamin. Do your research on the ratios. I'm not gonna do that here. That's a whole video in and of itself. Second to last, 
behavior. This is what makes them so amazing. They're hopping around all the time and they're so colorful. So the reason that I say they're like little hopping Skittles is because that's what they are. They're different colors, although I recommend always keeping the same species with each other because to mix them, it just it's very frowned upon in the dart frog community. So if you keep leucamellas, keep with leucamellas. If you have terribilis, keep them with terribilis. Either way, they're going to be moving and grooving. They're going to be hopping all over the place. They're going to be up during the day because they are a diurnal species. This is something that I really love about dart frogs is that you can watch them. They're not going to be moving around when you're sleeping. They're going to be up when you are up, if you're up during working hours. But either way, certain species are going to be more bold than others. So for example, my Tinctoria species, they are usually pretty active during the day. They move around quite a bit. You don't have to worry about them hiding. Things like my Terribilis, they are very bold. They're going to be right up the front of the enclosure. They don't hide at all. And then there's things like Leucamellas, uh, Aratus. They do hide quite a bit. They're going to be quite a bit more shy in my experience. So just pick certain species depending on what you like. And lastly, price, availability, and morphs. So in terms of morphs, I'm not gonna really get too much into it because breeding dart frogs, you kinda wanna keep things together. Like if you want to breed Azurius, right? So Tinctorius Azurus, you breed those. You don't mix them with others, although they could definitely interbreed, we don't do that in the dart frog community. You can read all about why. That's I'm just gonna leave it like that for this video. But in terms of price and availability, dart frogs are really available. And the price really depends on what they are. There's a video that my friend Mike Titula just made about him and some of our buddies. We're all Canadians and they got a dart frog order worth $65,000. These are very rare species in Canada. It's very difficult to bring them across borders. But then of course there's other things like my Leucamellas, which I bought for about $75 per frog. My Arata, $75 per frog. There are certain species that are just much cheaper than others, and there are certain species that are really expensive, like $1,000 plus per dart frog. So they're really available, but certain species aren't, and that drives up the price. The more available, generally the cheaper that they are. So there you go. That's how you take care of poison dart frogs, one of my favorite species. I really hope you enjoyed this. Let me know in the comments section, what is your favorite dart frog species that you keep? And as always, thanks for hitting like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. There's more videos like this if you'd like to subscribe. And a special thanks to the Patreon supporters. You guys get videos early, discounts on merch, a whole bunch of behind the scenes stuff, and all more for $1 a month. So for as little as a dollar a month, you can be part of the Patreon club too. And that's it. Because we do videos twice a week, that means I'll see you in the next one.